you are listening to The Golden Ratio. As always, this is Zach. So I've been getting a lot of questions lately about GMOs. How do they affect us? What does that word even mean? So I decided to bring in a special guest today, uh, expert in the field, uh, Tyler Darrington. Say hello, Tyler. Hi, guys. So I guess the question right off the bat, the most question, common question I've been getting is just what is a GMO? Okay, let's dive right in. Well, GMO stands for Genetically Modified Organism. What happens is, is genetic engineers take a section of DNA from an organism that expresses a desired characteristic, and then they join it with other sections of DNA by firing them into a plant cell. As the cell repairs itself because it's damaged from this, the new DNA is integrated into the plant's genome. Now, most GMO foods eaten are from plants genetically engineered to express either a protein that is unaffected by a specific herbicide so that you can, let's say, spray a field of crops and weeds without the herbicide doing damage to the crop but still killing the weeds, or expressing a protein that when eaten by a grub or other pests, they, their stomachs rupture and die and it kills them. Um, some of the GM plants out there do both. So you use the word scientists and maybe engineers or something. I'm hearing the human thing involved in this. So when I hear human, I think like history. So how long has this been happening? Well, human consumption of GMO crops started in 1992. Wait, like I feel like we've been changing and maybe modifying our crops for a really long time, right? Yeah, so, well, we talked about GMOs, and in contrast to what I just told you about genetically modified organisms, traditional plant breeders have, have changed crops for a long time, but the way they do that is they take a plant with a desired characteristic, such as high yield, and they'll cross-pollinate it with another plant that is uh, this is very close, if not the same, in breed and with a different desired characteristic, such as disease resistant. And then they'll get a new crop from that. But again, that's from cross pollinating. It's sort of like breeding a golden retriever with a poodle and making a golden doodle, right? But when we're talking about GMOs, we're talking about sections of inserted DNA that can come from plants not normally eaten uh, by humans, like flowers, for example, petunias. Bacteria like Bacillus thuringiensis, animals like fish genes and tomatoes, or viruses like the cauliflower mosaic virus. Uh, this is kind of more like breeding a golden retriever with a flying squirrel and making flying retrievers or something along those lines. And this process may turn genes in a plant off or on. It could affect the function of other genes. They could produce new toxins or allergens or produce new characteristics, such as higher levels of toxins than was previously found in the wild ancestor of the plant. So when you mention this crossbreeding, I'm going straight to thinking in my head, mad scientists in a lab, or you mentioned like flying poodles or something like that. Should I be concerned about this? Well, I'll give you some examples of some potential reasons to be concerned. Now, there's lots of them out there, and there's lots of people who disagree with these, um, it's not the most clear and concise uh, information out there, but there, there is some. Um, for example, seven years after uh, the release of Roundup Ready Soy, which is the, the soy crop that is capable, it has a protein that can survive glyphosate being sprayed on it, which is the main chemical found in Roundup, the same Roundup that you probably have in your garage. Um, that Roundup Ready Soy, Monsanto found, that it contained two DNA segments which they were previously unaware of. Um, an another concern is, is that the insert may not be stable over many generations, resulting in degrading or changing or, or moving of these genes. Um, there's been a few animal studies that show that DNA in our food can travel into our organs throughout our entire body. This can lead to the transfer of new pr proteins in our bodies. Um, Again, causing unknown side effects. There's, there's not a huge consensus on that. Um, when it comes to the, the BT toxin that we spoke on earlier, there's, there's a lot of concerns about that. Uh, several crops have been genetically engineered with this BT toxin, um, like BT corn, BT potato, that sort of thing. Uh, they call these crops BT crops in general. And the genes allows the crops to consistently make the toxin internally. So... Before, we used to spray the toxin on the crops in emergency circumstances when there was a lot of pests coming in, and that could be washed off of the crop. Well, now the crop makes it itself, so it's actually producing this, this toxin 
and then the bugs eat them, and it, and it ends up killing the bugs themselves. Um, the, another a fun fact about these seeds in particular is they're neon in color. They can be green or blue, which is obviously not natural. Uh, in some studies where mice were fed the Bt toxins, the microscopic structure of the small intestine was damaged. Another study saw excessive cell growth in the stomach lining that can lead to cancer, and they also had damage to other organs and their immune system. Uh, you know, again, these are just a few examples of the potential downsides of GMOs. So I'm, I guess I'm just thinking, like, is this something happening on maybe one or two experimental farms, or is it happening in a larger scale? It's a very large scale. They, they are mass-producing these crops. If you've had breakfast today, or any meal, let's say, odds are that you've ingested several different forms of genetically modified crops. So then that leads me to more concern, like, shouldn't the government be testing it? Are they testing it? Like, what's happening on that front? All right, well, <clears throat> the Food and Drug Administration, known as the FDA, has the primary responsibility for safety of our food. Um, they can take action if a food presents some kind of safety risk on the market. Uh, in, in November, sorry, excuse me, November 1st, 1991, the FDA received a memorandum from the Division of Food, Chemistry, and Technology. Now, this is prior to the approval of, of GMOs. The, in the document, it pointed to all of the undesirable effects uh, that might be produced by the technique of gene manipulation or creating genetically modified crops, such as increased levels of known naturally occurring toxins, appearance of new, not previously identified toxins, increased ca capability of uh, concentrating toxic substances from the environment, like increased uh, concentrations of pesticides or heavy metals, and undesirable alterations in levels of nutrients. Now, even with that, and that's just one piece of several documents that were sent to the FDA, or that internal members that worked for the FDA pointed out, the FDA moved on. And they regulated the GMOs under the 1986 Coordinated Framework for the Regulation of Biotechnology, known as the CFRB. The CFRB states that the product should be the focus of regulation, not the process, meaning the final product produced by the biotechnology companies, and not the process at which they do it. Uh, the CFRB identified no new categories of risk associated with GE crops in comparison to non-GE crops and found no new laws to be required for the regulation of GE crops, foods, and other products. So they were essentially saying that GE crops are so similar to traditional crops that there was no need to regulate them any differently. The funny thing is, is if you go to the patent office, though, there's a much different story because the biotechnology companies are patenting their genetic modifications, saying that they're so different from traditional crops that they can actually sell them and make money off them and no one else can produce them. But if you talk to the FDA, the crops are so similar that there's no reason to regulate them or test them any differently than other crops. So and the FDA made the decision in 1992 to treat GE foods as substantially equivalent to conventional foods unless there is a reason that they should be treated otherwise. Um, under this policy, producers are voluntarily, okay, I want to point that word out, voluntarily asked to submit data on their GE foods to the FDA through a consultation process. It is thought that the vast majority, possibly all of the manufacturers of GE foods, have gone through the FDA's consultation process. But I've found some research out there that shows that They've denied the FDA um, additional information when the FDA has requested it. Now, proponents of GE foods often argue that we have been consuming these GE foods for over two decades without any observed adverse health consequences, and that there's no reason to single them out for more regulatory scrutiny than traditional conventional bread food. Opponents argue that we have not been looking hard enough for the health consequences and that over long periods of time with low-level consumption, there may be chronic effects that go undetected in, when we're looking at them. I, I guess to summarize this, much of the disagreement comes down to whether people prefer proof of safety or proof of harm approaches to regulating food and checking for safety. It boils down to what do you, what do you believe in? I'm curious, uh, what are other countries saying about these GMOs? How does the world feel about GMOs? Okay, well, a lot of countries in Europe have made GMOs illegal. Uh, 
or they've required that GMOs be labeled. So if there's any kind of genetically modified organism or food or crop in your food, there has to be a label on it and, and or they're illegal. Um, there's some reports and some research that's going on. To be honest, the, um, the least biased research is going on in Europe and in other parts of the world because Monsanto doesn't have their fingers in everything quite as much. Um, but we've got a few reports that I can, I can quote here. Um, so we talked a little bit about herbicides. So the problem with making a crop that can be sprayed with herbicides is that we can spray the crop directly with chemicals, right? Before, we used to spray the weeds directly because otherwise we would hurt the crops, which required more work, more effort, more time. Um, but now we can spray them directly. And according to the World Health Organization, glyphosate, which is also known as Roundup, which is the same stuff you have in your garage, is a probable carcinogen. And that is the main chemical that we spray on our crops for herbicides, using herbicides or weed killers. Um, we talked a little bit about pesticides, or the BT pesticide. A report presented to the UN Food and Pollution Experts on March 7th of 2017 this year stated that chronic exposure to pesticides has been linked to cancer, Alzheimer's, and Parkinson's disease, hormone disruption, developmental disorders, and sterilization of humans. And we talked again that these crops are now producing these pesticides themselves, meaning that in their makeup, we are con when we eat that, we are consuming those pesticides completely. And it can't be washed off. Basically, the world, they're just a little suspicious of GMOs. Okay, so I feel like that was a lot of information. I'm going to take it in before kind of making a decision and figuring out how I feel about them overall. But I would like you for a minute to take off your scientist coat, put on your civilian hat, and tell me what is your stance on GMOs. I just... I've done a lot of research, and what it boils down to is that it's really hard to decide what side to fall on. And, and that has been one of the biggest challenges for me because the scientific community, community is so divided. And you really can't make heads or tails of it when you start digging in. You, you read something and you're like, oh, they're pro-GMO, they're really biased, or they're anti-GMO, they're really biased. And it's just really hard to distinguish between the two and figure out why. One of the things... There's two reasons I settled on the side that I settled on. Um, one is, is I believe if you start following the money and you start paying attention to who works for Monsanto, who in the FDA used to work for Monsanto, because there's some fun in uh, history in there. When all these policies were being made, there was people who previously worked for Monsanto that worked for the FDA. And you start to see how much money can be made from patenting Mother Nature and being able to force the country to grow this crop. They can sell so much of it. It's worth billions of dollars. When you know that, then you know that the research can be twisted or manipulated. People who come out against it can be buried and their careers ruined. And so when you start to think in those terms, you start to question really how honest is the scientific community being on both sides. And when there's as much money as there is, I have a hard time believing in the pro-GMO side, um, saying that things are as safe as they are. Not to mention the fact that for me, it's kind of common sense. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of potential side effects. There's a lot of things that we don't know, and when we don't know something, do we just go in and risk everything to figure it out, or do we step back and and look at it cautiously? So I'm a big believer in the proof of safety before we start eating this stuff, and it uh, it really upsets me how it just got dumped into the uh, into the American food system without anybody knowing, without any real testing. We didn't really talk about the level of testing that's been done on GMOs. I can only find one human trial that was done, and it was tested with BT corn, and it was tested to find enzymes in the digestive tract, which they found, um, showing that the, the BT toxin was making it through our digestive system, which doesn't directly affect, uh, affect us, but it can affect all of the bacteria in our gut. We have good bacteria in there that's intended to help digest our food and we're creating food that kills bacteria and pests and then we're eating it and assuming that it's not going to have a, a terrible effect on our systems. And again, this sort of thing is hard to prove and it's hard to know uh, how much damage it's doing because it's long-term chronic damage which can creep up in different people in different ways. 
but we can all we've all heard about celiac disease at this point in time a lot of people believe that the change in our food source is what's brought upon this epidemic of celiac disease or gluten insensitivity or gastrointestinal digestive problems which is huge we also see a massive weight gain that's going on in this country which obviously processed foods are a part of it um, inactivity is a part of it it's not just one thing but you have to start to ask yourself are these proteins these genes that were twisting and changing inside of our food having an adverse effect because other scientists say that if our body doesn't recognize a type of food or a type of protein it stores it it doesn't know what to do with it it doesn't burn it as a calorie it just stores it as fat so there's a lot of potential problems so much so that I can't get behind being pro GMO so let's say I'm listening to this and you swayed me I'm a concerned citizen at this point um, my last question for you would be what can I do about this? Well, there's the <clears throat> obvious answer, maybe like joining those um, rallies, in, in, you know, at the state capitol to request labeling of GMOs. There's all there's all of that kind of stuff. Um, but a lot of people don't have time for that, or they're not dedicated enough for that. And I wouldn't ask somebody to go out there and do that if they're not as passionate about it as I am. What I would tell you is start to become aware. Number one, just start to become aware of what you're purchasing and what you're buying. And until the day comes when we label GMOs in our food, you're not really going to be able to always tell. But just assume that if it doesn't say organic or non-GMO certified, that it's GMO. And if you really care about your health and your family's health, you should start buying organic. And it's, it's just as simple as you're powerful. And the way you spend your money is the way you cast your vote for things in this country. And so if you start spending your money in different places, companies will start to see that there's profit in jumping on the, the organic side. And then there'll be more money for the farmers to grow organic food. There'll be more organic food, which will drive down the prices of organic food because the demand will be higher. And we can win out just by purchasing differently. Okay, I'd say that about does it. Uh, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, man, I appreciate you having me. And uh, thank you for all your, to all your listeners out there who, who participated in this. And I hope that I was able to uh, educate and, and share some things.